So we're now going to look at factors affecting vulnerability in someone's likelihood of abuse. The reason why we look at this is so that we know how to look out for this type of thing. Um, who do we have to pay special attention to in care settings to make sure that we're vigilant all the time for any signs uh, of the following? Um, but in terms of our assignment, we have to write about it in, in, in kind of this following way. So we have to first explain the factors which both contribute to and uh, reduce the likelihood of abuse. So that's kind of, you know, the last, uh, the, the past criteria. But then for our merit, we have to explain why this means that we have to um, essentially kind of look out for abuse ourselves. So there are factors which make things more likely to happen. You know, what can we do then that perhaps reduces this likelihood or helps to mitigate this? Um, that's going to be the merit criteria. And then the distinction criteria, this is where we're actually justifying procedures around responding to abuse. So that's going to be more stuff that we do next lesson, but we can weave it in as we go uh, in, this, in this assignment. The, these three criteria are supposed to be kind of welded together. So when we talk about factors affecting vulnerability, there are a few specific groups of vulnerable individuals that we have to identify and explain why they are vulnerable. The first is going to be children and babies. These are obviously unable to either resist any potential abuse, but also they may struggle in communicating any issues that they have experienced, either because they're not sure what's happened or they lack the capability to actually communicate it. There's also the elderly. The elderly are often, again, in a physically weaker state, and they often feel very isolated and afraid because of their weakened state and may feel more potentially threatened or intimidated by an abusive individual. Once you've explained those individual groups in your assignment, you then have to explain the factors that contribute to individuals being vulnerable. The first is physical vulnerability. This includes things like physical disabilities, chronic medical conditions or sensory impairment. It's important to understand why these may lead certain people to be more vulnerable to abuse. And it's not simply that they can't physically resist any potential abuse or fully comprehend it, but it's also that they may feel more prone to intimidation and may feel less empowered overall to speak out about their abuse. It's important to note that physical vulnerability often links in with kind of an emotional vulnerability, a feeling of anxiety, a feeling of social isolation. And these things will never really come on their own. They will also interplay with other factors that affect vulnerability. The second factor we need to know is cognitive impairment, including things like dementia, Alzheimer's, special educational needs or speech impairments. All of these will affect an individual's ability to understand what's happening to them. So they may not be able to fully comprehend that what they're experiencing is abuse. They may misinterpret it as something which is normal. They may even misinterpret it as something which is friendly. People who have dementia will also possibly forget what has happened. And also, with all of these things in mind, even if they do come to the realisation that something is happening to them which is abusive, they may also struggle to actually communicate efficiently to the appropriate people to get it sorted. Our next factor is emotional vulnerability. This includes things such as depression, anxiety or severe phobias. These will often lead people to feel very isolated and feel very vulnerable to any potential emotional manipulation. But they will also be very prone to attaching themselves to other people because of their emotional vulnerability. This leaves abusers with a potential way of manipulating an individual. And sadly, these individuals will be even more prone to harm when that manipulation takes place. Next, we have social vulnerability. This includes things like general social isolation, loneliness, or institutionalised behaviour, 
where someone has recently come out of an institution of some kind. These people are more vulnerable to abuse and manipulation because their isolation and loneliness strips them of the empowerment to speak out about their issues. And if someone does not have a strong social circle around them, they may lack the people to identify to them that they are being abused and encourage them and empower them to speak out. But also people who are socially isolated aren't exposed to many people who would identify their abuse. Another factor which can increase the likelihood of abuse or neglect isn't necessarily something to do with the individual, but it's also um, to do with the organisation in which you're working. If the care setting or the hospital or whatever that you're working with has a low level of staff, this can mean that often tasks are left undone, which could possibly lead to neglect. But also, if staff are overworked, if staff are um, kind of rushing around and, and unable to um, kind of have a moment to themselves, then this will again increase the likelihood that they may be potentially like verbally abusive. Um, so staffing issues can actually be a, another potential factor which actually does um, contribute to abuse potentially.